few months ago I, I did or yeah I just don't feel like going on anymore you put yes and the rest of the screen opens up well what are you thinking mm -hmm. suicidal thoughts have you got a plan well, yeah I gave my dog away to my neighbor next door because I didn't want him to be without somebody to take care of him and um, I've got a guy yeah, they start going into a plan Ooh, that's serious how often do you think about it I, I, it's all day now the past week or so I just think about it all the time those intrusive thoughts so you see that is a full screen but that first question opens up that door to find out more instead of me just a bunch of all of us subjectively looking at the same patient could handle it differently so all patients now have to be um, screened for suicide um, so you screen for suicide and with the depressive disorder just know that that's a risk with these patients um, help identify their coping strategies that's real important um, if somebody can tell you that they cope with it, um, the feelings that they've had, the depressive mood they've been in, you know, I take my medications, I try to keep exercising even though I'm down, you know, I can tell it's coming on and I don't call it to work and I try to get up. They've got some coping mechanisms. They're still working. They're still effective coping mechanisms. Um, you want to support activities that increase their socialization. Well, you've been here a couple of days, you've been in your room your whole time, we really need you to get out and come eat, dinner, come eat lunch with everybody at the table. Support them in trying to socialize. Teach them about the disorder. You know, I know you're having a lot of bad thoughts about yourself. Remember we said self-deprecating um, behaviors? And um, I know you've, you know, you've got a lot of negative self-talk talk going on. But today we're going to talk a little bit about the disorder and what, where these thoughts come from and all and help them understand the disease. On the mental health unit, the RNs are responsible for coming up with what topics they're going to teach every day. So you can see, they may not know, they may have clients with all sorts of disorders, but they may pick one type of disease that they may teach about just to help people understand what's going on. And then tomorrow they may teach about something else. Engage in a therapeutic alliance. I'm going to work together with you. We have an agreement to work together. Keeping your promises, building some trust with this person. Support their progress to, towards their goals. Um, collaborate with the treatment team. Really important. The treatment team, hopefully you'll be able to see it in your clinicals. Uh, it's the best, like I said, best example of interdisciplinary care I've almost ever seen. Because you have everybody in there the doctor, the therapist, the social worker, the nurses, the techs, the dietitian, and um, you want to collaborate with that team and tell them what you've been seeing going on with the patient so you can all kind of track the um, progress the client is making. They could go in the room with the provider, the doctor, get their medications adjusted and tell the doctor everything's going great. I slept all last night, I'm eating better, I'm ready to go home. That's why you have interdisciplinary team. Well, Leslie, how has he been doing on the floor? He hasn't slept since he's been here. We, I talked to night shift at report this morning and he still didn't sleep last night. You know, so that interdisciplinary team is key because you're watching how they're doing. Help identify symptoms of anxiety. So often with depression, anxiety is, um, is a part of it. So you want to see how, um, how anxious they feel. And when, as they're progressively moving along, just the nature of the disorder helps them minimize successes that they've had. So the RN is a good person to say, well now remember last week you, you said you couldn't do this, but do you remember Saturday? It was a great day, look at what you did, you know, and, and help them recall their successes so that they're not just constantly beating themselves up. So that is the end of that slide. Let me look at my notes.
these few slides come from a book talking about just the differences in the, the swings with bipolar and just how good the manic phase feels. Um, I'm not going to go over this one because we've covered it. Tomorrow we'll recap a little before we move on to everything else, like we did before to make sure we get on everything. Okay, grief and loss is in the mood section because grief obviously affects our mood. It's important to remember there's a lot of different type of losses. It's not just necessarily the death of somebody, but it can be a loss to someone and that someone can have grief over it. So real important to remember this when you're in, working as a nurse. The, of course, the most obvious and most significant loss is the death of a loved one. But people can also grieve the loss of like their self-esteem, their identity, dignity. Um, I have a friend, and she, I, I talked to her on Facebook the other day, and she knows I share this story. She was one of our nurses in New Orleans, and she got septic. I'm not quite sure what it was from, maybe an IUD or something. She had an eight-week-old baby and two other kids. She got septic and um, came into the emergency room. They saw her and gave her some antibiotics. She went home and got so sick she couldn't walk out to the car, so her husband had to carry her and brought her back in, and she ended up in a coma. And they had her on so many presser meds, try to keep her blood pressure up, when she was in ICU, she ended up losing both her legs, um, her left hand, and her finger right hand down to her first knuckle. She was 29. And then she miraculously lived. I mean, we were in with the priest when they gave her her last rites. Um, so she lives, and she's a real fighter. She has a, a prosthesis on both legs. I mean, she went right into therapy and got prosthesis on both legs. She sells Lula that brand of clothes. Mm -hmm. She didn't go back to work in the hospital. Um, and she's like done spokesperson work for the brand, you know, because she's such a success story. She's really been good at it. But she even posted something the other day that she woke up grieving her legs. You know, and she and I even talked. She said it, the guilt that she would feel for grieving the, her body in it. She said, how awful is it? I've got three little kids, and I'm laying here in the bed mad that I don't have my legs. You know, but she did, she had to go through that process to grieve the loss of her overall body image, and most specific, her independence, you know, and, and so she posted something on Facebook the other day, and I told her, I said, I share your story so often. But her daughter, the, that was the eight week old, when she got septic, is now getting on up there, and she said, I was laying in bed feeling bad that I didn't have legs. And she said, and then up walks my daughter with my fake legs. said, Mom, put your leg on you know, we got to go. <laughs> and she's like, and I just thought to myself, you know, how awful. So she, you see what she's struggling with, a lot of the guilt, and I shouldn't feel this bad, but she had to work through that, and she still has to work through that. It was such a loss for her. And, you know, we were all just really aware of it as soon as she came out of the coma and, start, and started talking we were all like this is going to be real hard for her to move through this loss and the guilt so you know change of locale job loss for some people is a huge loss that they have to grieve so just always be cognizant of what your patient might be going through and what may be a really bad loss to me may not be something uh, maybe something really significant in someone else's life. Sorry. Responses to loss can be physical, cognitive, behavioral, and affective. And that's the same with depression, too. They think that some of the neurologic, um, the fact that you have neurons and all in your brain and throughout different parts of your body 
may be why you get physical symptoms when you're depressed, that you may hurt when you're depressed. Um, and I will tell you, a certain level of grief makes you physically sick. You know, the grief can just be so um, overwhelming that you have almost like flu-like symptoms. Um, and so the responses to loss can be a physical response, feeling physically sick. Um, cognitive thought processes can change. Um, behavioral, the way you act, the way you get along with people and then your affect, your mood, how you um, come across. So wide range and um, impact. So what are those physical manifestations? Weakness, um, anorexia, the, the true anorexia, not wanting to eat. Um, feelings of choking, shortness of breath. Tightness in the chest. You, you'll have people sometimes that the grief is so severe they want it, they end up going to the hospital just to get worked up for an MI because they can't tell if something's really going on or are they just that upset over the grief. Um, GI disturbances, of course, sleep disturbances, and increased vulnerability. Not able to um, be not your normal self. So the thoughts that are going on, the cognitive manifestations of uh, grief. A preoccupation with the deceased. If it was a loss of a loved one, um, just preoccupied with that person, talking a lot about that person. So if you're around someone who's grieving, they're gonna need to, it helps for them to talk about it because they're probably preoccupied with this person. Difficulty concentrating. Um, goes without saying. A longing and a sadness, you know, a longing to want to see that person, and they could actually even have hallucinations. And things that are not there. So behavioral things, what do you see with grief? Um, disruption, disruption in their normal patterns of behavior. Um, It may be to the point where their activities that they were uh, living are interrupted, where they might have been a normal person that showered and washed their hair every day, those sort of things, those patterns are not the same. Um, inability to, um, they might have been a really organized person before and are able to um, stay on task and all, but now they're more disorganized, inability to keep on track. Disorganized thoughts. They may be distracted when you're trying to talk to them and just keep kind of jumping from one thing to the other. And things that were important to them before the loss may not be important at all. A change in what was important to them. And then their affect. Um, anywhere from sadness and guilt, loneliness, anger. Just run the gamut in emotional <coughs> affect. So what are some definitions? Grief is an internal emotional reaction to loss. Bereavement is the state of grieving. And mourning are the actions and the expressions of grief. Kind of with grief, the approach to how healthcare professionals deal with uh, grief is, has changed. Again, you know, used to they always just strictly taught us the stages of grief and that people move through these stages of grief and then they're better. Um, well, the whole approach now is a little bit different and we understand that they may go through the patterns of grief and then backtrack and do them again. Everybody is different in how they deal with the grief. Um, and there used to be a hesitancy to ever call grief depression and diagnose somebody with depression because they didn't want to stigmatize people. So um, there was a hesitancy to even kind of have any crossover. Oh, they're just grieving. They're not depressed. Um, they're, it's just, you know, she's just sad. She's not got a problem like depression. 
but now you will see a quicker move to go ahead and if you think it's depression, go ahead and screening, working them up for depression, and if they need something for the depression, go ahead and treat it earlier than not, like within about two months, instead of just ignoring it until someone is um, just in a snip. But you still kind of still categorize grief. Um, anticipatory grief, um, I don't know, you may have seen this with people too, especially with someone with a chronic illness in their family, and they're already anticipating the loss of that family member before they die. But they know they're going to die. So you will see them start moving through some of the grief process and some of this disorganized thinking, sadness, all the changes in their normal pattern may happen, especially with a child. You know, then you know they have like a child with a cancer diagnosis. You'll see their parents moving through anticipatory grief. Another friend, and again, she probably wouldn't even mind if I shared her name, but her son, she lost her son to DIPG, that brain cancer. And when they went to St. Jude's with him that first visit, they automatically put the parents in, into counseling. So they saw counselors as part of this thing. It's similar to like my brother's story. Uh, I got married on his birthday and that year when I talked to him. He asked me how my anniversary was. I was like, great. And how was your birthday? And this is the grief. I couldn't enjoy it because I didn't know if it's going to be my last. Yeah. yeah. And unfortunately it was. Uh -huh. Well, you will see people go ahead and these this disorganized thinking, this sadness, and all. Of course, they're going through it already. They know this person is going to be going through experience. Acute grief is a painful experience. Um, you know, it happened. You didn't get to plan ahead. It was acute. We came on. Then dysfunctional grief. Um, <coughs> This is what you used to always hear instead of the depression, but dysfunctional grief. Um, usually you see it associated where the death was traumatic, unplanned, um, and then the person's not moving along in a normal pattern with the grief. It's complicated with all sorts of other um, problems. It's lasting for a chronic period of time. It's two years later and they're still grieving and these issues going on with grief are still happening to them. So the best way to categorize it is dysfunctional grief. And then there's chronic sorrow. And I kind of think, um, and the book talks about it too, chronic sorrow, um, my grandmother was um, 96 and um, Sorry, it's Dr. Scott. And it sure was sad. I hated to see her die. And I grieved her. And it took a while, and it was really sad. But then I'm, I'm, I'm over it. I don't have chronic sorrow over that. She had a long life. I'm able to um, digest it all and think through it normally. But I think with like the loss of a child, or maybe even the loss of a significant other that was like your life partner, it's just not realistic to think that you're going to get over that feeling. You're going to have sorrow over that life chronically. Because there'll be talk about sometimes, <laughs> especially like in L&D and things, um, if you had a child and you sent your child to summer camp, you're going to miss them after a week. But if they stayed at summer camp for two years, you're not going to be like, oh, I don't miss them anymore. You're going to miss them more. So it's almost like the loss of a child just kind of compiles upon itself. You can't expect that to all of a sudden be like, oh, I'm better now. You'll deal with chronic sorrow. So, um, so one thing that we um, didn't talk a lot about with the stages of grief, and we didn't talk about it a lot in depression, was um, numbing and blunting of your emotions. And sometimes with depression and other things like grief, you will talk about um, blunting of emotions. Um, that's when you just don't see the full range of emotion, the blunted.
So at first they kind of um, avoid the whole loss. They may be in denial. You'll hear people, patients, people say, I just can't believe it really happened. You know, if he hadn't have gone, uh, you know, if they hadn't been driving that day, they wouldn't have had the car wreck. They kind of have to ruminate over it because it just shouldn't have happened. So they're kind of in that denial phase. But then they'll confront it and they move through that, the confrontation stage of grief. And that's active mourning. Um, they may be disorganized, they're in despair, they, they're, they're aware that they've lost this person. But then you will see them move back into the reestablishment stage, trying to get back to their normal. And it's a gradual process. It, it, they have to reorganize themselves, especially if it was a significant loss. And they would start to go through the recovery. Um, And this just goes through, again, we've already pretty much discussed it, the things they may um, feel during the grief. The task of grief, and you will deal with this with families, or in your family, they'll tell the story over and over again. These are just tasks. These are things that people feel like they have to do with grief, and so they'll tell the story of what happened, expressing their sadness, talking about any guilt, they feel anger. They'll go back over their relationship with them. That you know, we were just so close. Um, this was my um, we married. We met in high school. They'll go back over the relationship with the person. They'll start to explore life after the loss of the person. I'm not sure what I'm going to do. Um, they'll start talking about their plans, and they're going to need to be. They have the task of needing to feel like they are accepted by other people and their. They need to know that other people understand. Complicating factors. Pain of great intensity. So you'll see like self-medicating or even, you know, thoughts of dying. Anything to relieve the pain. And like we say, a lot of times, a lot of times when people talk about suicide, again, it's not that I want to die. I want to kill myself. It's I want to get away from this pain. It's so bad. Um, some people um, depends on their culture it may not be okay to express these feelings and we already talked about part of the task is talking about it and talking your way through it the normal process of grieving but some cultures expect people to keep things inside and not discuss it so that could complicate someone's grief they may need to talk but their cultural group doesn't accept this um, there's also a lot of anxiety, a lot of uh, fear of losing control that can complicate their grief. Some of the things that we can do as nurses, um, prevention before the loss, um, family involvement in the community, improved parenting, when loss is impending, help them. Um, maybe go ahead and suggest some grief therapy. Um, needs of the dying patient. Uh, we always say it's really hard for nurses to realize, and doctors to almost all, to realize when a patient is going from we're trying to take care of them and get them better to where they're actively dying. I'll never forget my grandmother literally looked at me and said, took the washcloth off her face and said, you know I'm going to die today. <laughs> That was just my grandma, and I was like, yeah. I, and I really did. She looked really different. She had she had COP, um, CHF. She had a total different look to her. She was the 96-year-old, and I was her only grandchild, so we were super close. And she said, well, you know I'm going to die today. I said, yeah, I kind of thought so. And she said, don't tell your mother. I'm like, oh, I think she's going to find out. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but the needs of the dying patient, she and I are in here having this conversation. We, we, we go ahead and see some family men. She planned her funeral. It was perfect for her and I that it went that way. You know, it couldn't have gone any better. And she told me what she wanted to do, and I told Mom and Dad what we were going to do. And uh, 
I remember, and the nurses on the floor were real attached to her. And um, she was a real private person, and it was like, I'm not gonna clean her up on the bedpan. That was just not what she wanted me to do. And I can remember hearing one of the nurses saying something about, and her granddaughters and hers. They were mad that I didn't clean her up. And, um, and then they came in at one point and said, she really needs her breathing treatment. She looked at me and was like, I said, we're not gonna do it. And, I, I, and we heard them kind of mumbling later. It's almost like they thought we were trying to just speed it up. You know, we were trying to kill grandma by not giving her breathing following treatment. Following what she wanted. It with. was what, it was her autonomy her decisions, mm -hmm. and I mean, the cardiologist was already like, whatever y'all want to do, you know, the rest of the day. So just never forget that every family is different, and the patients have their own needs, you know, and as long as they're not really trying to kill them all. <laughs> so, um, but the dying patient has unique needs, and it depends on that person. And it is going to be real hard for you as a nurse, and you, some of y'all already work in the hospitals or work in in healthcare, so you know that. But um, always don't forget to be assessing what the family and what that patient needs, and it's not about you, always. Um, as long as the patient's being taken care of and something bad is um, Explain the patient's condition and treatment. Um, teach self-care and promoting self-esteem, as long as they can. Uh, teach family members to assist in the care where it's appropriate. It was like grandma be like, we that. if we'd have been home or something, I might have been, but she didn't want me to do that. Um, and meet the needs of the family and the dying patient. Um, in the hospital, um, care of the body. It depends on where you work, what you will have to do. Um, some hospitals or some places, the funeral home will come get the body on the floor. Sometimes you'll have to take. The body to the uh, morgue in the hospital or where you keep it. Um, identification then is just as important as it is any time. Imagine the bad day it was when you sent the body to the funeral home without a tag and you sent two people, so ID and um, respect, taking care of the body. Um, like in labor and delivery, we don't put a time limit on how long someone can keep the baby. I and one time. I had a supervisor call and say, when are you getting this baby down to the ward? Well, as soon as mom and dad are finished holding the baby, it's the only time they're gonna see their baby. Um, so it's very, very <coughs> personal. Um, they actually make little beds now for L&D that are cool, they're cooling beds, which, but it keeps the baby um, from not, the breakdown and stuff from not happening quite as fast, and so if the baby does, if they want to keep the baby in the room for a lot longer, the will it uh, for longer. Um, and you know, death is just something we are all gonna have to deal with, but you're the lifeline a lot of times to that family for teaching and explaining what may happen next and helping them understand what's happening at the time. Um, you're gonna have to review organ donation arrangements, if any and a lot of it, whatever education goes along with that, the timing of this procedure, um, labeling the body, death certificate issued and signed. Um, but again, it's just very personal and you're, uh, you've got to check your own emotions before you start caring for these clients. And we will be about finished. This is gonna be it. Um, if it's a sudden death, if you're working on the floor and someone codes and you weren't planning on it, one of your, the main things for a nurse is get the family somewhere situated and get somebody in them. You, or the, you need to be in the room with the code, but somebody needs to be with the family. Um, if you know the patient's gonna die, you want to go ahead and make your plans on how we're gonna do this. Um, do you want, who's gonna be in here? Who's gonna stay? Do you want to come in after the um, after they die? Do you want to stay with them? Do you want to help take care of them after they pass away? So a lot of questions. Um, it is appropriate. Um, I've gone fam uh, patients' funerals. It just depends on your relationship with the family. 
but um, you can do that and it is um, appropriate. Pretty much repeating, I will, like I did last week, we will kind of wrap up since it's a lot in a couple of days. I'm not going to We'll go back over it. You can study all this content today when we're doing the lab after lunch. Any questions? What was it like done? Good. See y'all back. Uh -huh. 49 in your book is a good uh, summary of the medication. And like we said, remember that just slows the progression. We went over the stages. They're on page 439. A couple of things we didn't that I wanted to hit on a little bit more was delusion, hallucination, and illusions. Sounds real simple to you. Um, delusions are fixed and they can't be altered. Um, delusions of grandeur. How we talked about when people are on that manic phase of the bipolar disorder and they're feeling really good about themselves, they may have delusions of grandeur. Those are a fixed thought that a patient has, and you're not going to change that. Okay. Hallucinations are, are different in that they are false sensory perceptions without any real stimulus. There's, you're seeing things, you're hearing things, and there's nothing in reality to make you have them. That's a hallucination. Yeah, sensory perceptions. And then illusions, an illusion is a misperception of something that you really see or hear. Like you wake up in the middle of the night and you're kind of confused and you see uh, a limb moving around outside your window and you have an illusion that it's somebody like trying to look in your window or something. How <laughs> did weird something happen in the night? I thought the dog's bark barking and I went to the door and I could have swear I saw my husband coming across the yard looking at the mail. It was around seven and it was dark and I went up there and he went in there and I was like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got this teacher and she <laughs> has all, all the things, things that she taught us about. Therapy. Everything that came up. You just got to understand. Well, so, um, Again, make sure you're looking at the table to understand the difference between delirium, depression, and dementia. And make sure you go over your meds. Your meds. And then, um, <coughs> mood disorders. But um, we just did mood, and with depression, one thing we didn't talk about were the phases of depression. Um, if you look, a good summary is on page 69 in your book. I think I touched on it, but acute phase, severe clinical findings of depression. Treatment is generally 6 to 12 weeks. And remember we said they may need to be in the hospital during this phase, maybe not the whole time, but this may be the reason why someone ends up in the hospital. And we said they were at risk for what? What do you need to really assess with them? Suicide, Suicide risk. And um, your main goal here is to reduce these symptoms, reduce the symptoms of the depression. And, um, bless you. Um, and now suicide, if you've got somebody on suicide precautions, um, and the policy is they're one-on-one -on -one observation, does that mean you sit at the nurse's station and you can kind of see their room around the corner? No, that means you sit there with them, correct? One-on-one, -on -one, with their arm's reach. Um, so always remember that, that that is what that means. Um, we were talking about nurse-patient ratio, you know, like in the hospital in the mental health unit. The big difference we talked about in unit one was 
the difference between an outpatient or something, when you go to the hospital, you have observation around the clock. Most mental health units, you have to lay eyes on every patient every 15 minutes. So you're documenting. And so the techs and the nurses work together. Sometimes these, you know, LPNs work together to make sure that everybody is seeing everybody every 15 minutes. But even then, if they're on suicide precautions, then they need to be within arm's reach and you watch them constantly. If you have to go do something, somebody comes and relieves you and watches them. <coughs> they don't have things like, like no shoestrings, no plastic bags. Um, you don't want your badge around your neck in those you know, units, just a lot of safety precautions. Then the continuation phase of uh, depression, they're improving their ability to function. Um, treatment here, this is after the acute phase, this treatment usually lasts four to nine months. And um, you do, you're still doing a lot of education. You're trying to keep them from relapsing. And medication management. Is this current regimen of medications working? Psychotherapy. So <coughs> therapy, med management, education, all working to keep them from relapsing. And then maintenance phase. This is remission of their um, symptoms. This is where they're not having the major depressive symptoms anymore. It could last for years. And your goal is to keep them from having another major depressive event. So, there's your goals of care. This Monitoring, I already talked about that for suicide risk. Um, helping with self care, um, especially during the acute phase. If they're so depressed that they've ended up in the hospital, this may be the patient that you have to um, go get and walk them down to the day room. They're not to the point where they're just going to come down and go by themselves. You um, may need to help them with their ADLs. Let me help you get get up and let's wash your face and all. Maybe put on some clothes mm -hmm. and change. And let me help you. You have to make time to be with them. They may not even talk at this point. They may not be able to talk much at this point. But you're like, you know, I'm going to come sit with you for 15 minutes today mm -hmm. after we finish group. Maintain that mm -hmm. um, relationship of trust. Be there when you say you're going to be there. And just sit with them as they're working through this. Um, you may want to make observations. You don't want to increase their anxiety, so you don't want to say things like, you know you were supposed to be down there at breakfast today and you weren't there. It might be better to say, I noticed you weren't at breakfast today, and let them talk to you instead of causing anxiety. Those communication skills. <coughs> Don't rush to fill um, empty air. I'm real guilty of that. Sometimes when you're talking or you're talking with a patient, you feel like you need to kind of fill the empty space. They're in a major depressive disorder. They're having trouble with their emotions and all. Give them time to answer. So sometimes just sit tight and wait. Give them time. Don't want to make them feel pressured. really about it with depression. Again, electroconvulsive therapy, ECT, is used a lot with depression. The only time I've really ever seen it used was with depression, major depressive disorder. A lot of times, like with a patient who's catatonic, you know, so depressed they're just hardly able to even communicate at all. And those are real good clients for electroconvulsive therapy. So go back over everything that we've been over. Okay, children. So this will be a real high level 
look at adolescent uh, mental disorders. Uh, well, all of this, we could really spend a lot more time on it this one than what we are. But um, one in five children and adolescents in the United States has a major mental illness. And what two thirds of all young people with mental health problems are not getting treatment. So two thirds are not getting treatment. What are some of the things that puts kids at risk? Um, a parent who has a mental disorder. History of abuse, neglect, and they witnessed or they witnessed violence. some of the causes, well, of course, some of it's genetic, and some of it is biochemical, even brain development, the same things we talked about before, neurotransmitters, develop, you know, brain issues. Also, things that contribute, can contribute are temperament, you know, some children just have a different temperament than others, but they more at risk. Then resilience pops up again. <laughs> The children that were abused, you may have a child over here that was abused and neglected. Well, you could have siblings in the same situation of abuse and neglect, witnessing violence, all those things that are risk factors. One sibling may end up with a major mental illness and the other sibling may just be fine. So some of it is resilience. Your ability to bounce back like we talked about in unit one. Some maybe the, the different genetic makeup of the kids that could even be different. And then their environmental factors. Your assessment with these patients is the same as with an adult. Use a mental status exam. Suicide risk. Culture and background. But then one thing, well, you also do it on adults, but real important with children, a developmental assessment. Developmental assessment. Remember in um, level two, when we were doing pediatrics, when we did the Denver developmental assessment, or when you were in newborn nursery and you did the uh, Dubowitz. And that's to see, is, is the child developmentally where their age is? Is this two-year-old developmentally acting like a two-year-old, or are they delayed? Because you don't want to be assessing a child for mental illness, and you're seeing things in their behavior that you think is m mental illness, and, and really come to find out the child just is developmentally not where they need to be. So do a good, you need to know a developmental assessment. At what level does this child perform? Are they on track development? Because here's the other thing. If they've had abuse and neglect to the point or you think there's some mental illness, you need to see if they're developmentally in Because what can that do? That can throw them off developmentally. If they're having some really awful things happen to them, then you also need to see, does it affect them developmentally? Do you have a five-year-old that doesn't have the the speech, the level of speech that they should. How can they talk to you? Do you have a two-year-old that can not walk or something? So mm -hmm. development. General interventions include family therapy, group therapy. Basically all the things we've already talked about with kids, but we'll hit on a few different things that are unique with children. You still got to manage the milieu. <coughs> if you're having a family group therapy and um, the 15 year old is abusive to some other people in the group and they can't control their actions, then you need to do like we talked about with the adults. 
take a break maybe and ask them to have this 15 year old step out because they're disrupting the group I mean. manage their behavior so that you can manage the group or manage the million um, you can use seclusion and restraints with children the last time I looked at the list of deaths in the country from restraints a lot of them were kids and a lot of them were physically holding restraints, you know, like in a, a, a adolescent group home or something, instead of putting them like in four points or something, they were doing physical holding and the child suffered, uh, I mean, uh, suffocated or something. So you can use all sorts of restraints on children. All the same safety guidelines apply. They actually, when we were on, our rotation last semester, they had to do a takedown and restraint from like a 13 year old that came in. It, it was so, it was upsetting. You could hear it, hear her all over the building and they eventually had to just physically take her down and medicate her and put her in restraints. And when we left for the day, she was still in restraints. So, the same safety guidelines. You use the least restrictive method first. You try everything you can. If they're unsafe, they're going to hurt themselves or others, you go ahead and put them in restraints, call the provider. You also could just try a quiet room or put a child in timeout to manage behavior. You also can do the cognitive behavioral therapy with children with mental illness, um, but you also might want to use play therapy. Children learn a lot through playing, and so sometimes you can just observe a child playing, or a therapist can play with them and try to work through, and they will talk to you and tell you things when they're playing that they wouldn't tell you otherwise. Bibliotherapy, they could tell a story or write a little story, and that would help you um, understand what's going on with them. <laughs> now some of the disorders you see in children, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, ADHD, oppositional defiant and conduct disorder, and ADD. You're assessing these students, these um, students, these mm -hmm. clients. You want to observe or assess for the relationship between them and their parents or their caregivers. And again, their developmental competencies. Are they developmentally where they need to be for their age? Then you're assessing their for ADHD. You're watching their attention span, their talkativeness, their activity level, just how. What are they doing? These clients are really at risk for um, hurting themselves or others. So a nursing care plan would be risk for self-directed or violence or violence to other people. You can't, if you're with them in group, for managing the milieu, say in an adolescent home, you can't let them be like lashing out and hitting another child. So if there's violent behavior, you just like with the adult, you separate them from the group. Impaired social interaction, part of your goals as a nurse and for the interdisciplinary team is to work on their social interaction skills. Just like with the adult, you're trying to build them a skill set so when they go out, they can function socially at the highest level as possible for them. Your main goals are to keep them safe. If they're running around and doing something that they're at risk for falling or hurting themselves or hurting somebody else, you have to stop them. And they need to learn effective coping skills. 
and learn how to build friendships. Part of the behavioral therapy with ADD, ADHD is rewarding good behavior and working out like a behavioral contract with the patient where they agree to behave within the safe bounds that y'all have come to an agreement on. You're trying to change the behavior that's negative. So you reward positive behavior. And a lot of it is teaching the parents these skills. Um, on the PowerPoint, there's a question that says, which statement demonstrates that a parent understands the diagnosis of attention deficit hyperactivity disorder? And the first one is, my child will never be able to graduate or go to college, but may be able to learn a, a vocational skill. Wrong. Um, my child's performance will improve in a structured setting that provides rewards for appropriate behaviors. Yes. That's it. Nothing is wrong with my child. The school hasn't provided qualified teachers in classroom settings. Denial. Denial. My child is just going through a stage. This problem will go away <laughs> with her. And that's you as an RN been able to explain the difference between stages or their development. You know, and they, we're not talking about this. You know, this type of behavior is not in a normal stage of development at all. You know, so um, this is different. Now, if it's a toddler, acting out, there are some acting out that toddlers do in certain stages, you know, but there's a difference between um, developmental miles, not meeting a developmental milestone and having ADHD. It's a set of behaviors that's hard to hyperactive behavior and you're given a stimulant, but it works together to help them um, perform better. Let me pull up to them. stimulant group for ADHD, but also in here is, is the SSRIs, tricyclics, and SNRIs.
not going to go over much else. I'm going to go ahead and let us start this activity and then finish up with the content for now. And then we'll do some more wrap-up on it all tomorrow. But let's go ahead and do the hearing voices and y'all can just study and I'll put together. Now the, the questions that we put together for y'all in ATI and Unit 2 um, cover just these topics and there are a lot of the different meds are in there too. So if you're taking it, um, that should be helpful. Um, Today, that's enough, and I'm just going to let y'all work on all this. We'll just do, finish up. I'll wrap it up, and then we'll do personality disorder. We're doing it all the time. Any other group? What need a So I'm going to go see if the room is already.